Today, we're gonna to be talking about light. We're gonna cover a few key concepts about lighting and some behaviors of light itself, like the inverse square law and how it affects us from a practical standpoint, because it's super important. More on that later, so that you will walk away from this video with some tools and frameworks to be able to light with confidence. So the most basic aspect of realistic lighting, as you probably already know, is motivation. Most of the times, if not all of the times, if we want to achieve realistic lighting, we are essentially trying to augment or recreate existing lighting sources, both artificial and natural ones, in a believable way, while at the same time making them aesthetically pleasing, which for the most part comes down to softening the light that falls on faces, especially for close-ups. Whenever we want to replicate or augment a light source, whatever that might be, we need to keep in mind three attributes of that source. The quality, the color, and the fall off. The quality of a light is fundamentally determined by the size of the light source in relation to the subject it illuminates. The larger the light source, the softer the light appears. So, as we emulate or augment a light source, it's best to keep in mind how hard or soft that light source is in real life. The majority of the times, we're gonna cheat the softness of a light source to make it more pleasing and nobody's gonna question that. But it's important to be aware of the raw, unaltered quality of the source just to have a rough idea of how much we can soften it while still maintaining a true-to-life feel. I'll give you an example. Here we have a wide shot of our talent on a sunny afternoon. In the wide shot, I'm not using anything else but straight hard sunlight. But as we cut to the close-up, I feel like the direct sunlight is a little bit too much and I want to soften up some of the texture of the skin while still maintaining the hard feeling of the light. So, as we want to diffuse it, we need to think of how hard the source we're trying to diffuse is, in this case the sun, and then work out what type of diffusion works best for our purpose. If we try softening the sun with some common heavy diffusion material, like in this case I just used the one we find in the 5-in-1 reflector, now all of a sudden it looks like a cloud just covered the sun and it doesn't cut well with the white shot. I mean, it doesn't look really believable to me. What I think works best here is to use a weaker diffusion material so we can still diffuse the light a bit, making it more aesthetically pleasing compared to the non-diffuse version, but respects the nature of the light source and it cuts perfectly with the wide shot. Also, a great resource to compare diffusion materials is the Lead Diffusion app, where you can scroll through every diffusion material they produce and compare the different effects in a very controlled setting. It also tells you how much light loss you're gonna experience with a particular diffusion material. It's free, it's great, give it a try. Now let's talk about color and more specifically about color temperature. So, if you only have one light illuminating the scene, it doesn't really matter what color temperature that light is, because by adjusting the white balance in camera or in post, you're gonna shift the whole image in the desired direction. But in order to be able to shift the image in the same way when using multiple lights, it's important that the color of our film lights matches as closely as possible the color of the sources they are augmenting. We can perform the match by eye, by looking at the monitor, or we can use specific tools to measure the color temperature of a light. And by doing that, we can eliminate the guesswork and be as effective as possible. For me, a very cost-effective way to do so on a budget is through an app called Kelvin Meter, which didn't sponsor this video at all. I bought it with my own money. I didn't even remember how much it cost. I'm gonna put it on the screen somewhere, but um, basically it can measure the color temperature of a light by bouncing that light off of a white surface, like a white piece of paper, and reading the bounce, it tells you very accurately what temperature the light source is. For example, in the setup here, I have a table lamp in the background with uh, some tungsten looking LED bulbs in it. I set the color temp of my key light at 3200 to match the tungsten color temperature, but as you can see, there's not really a match there. And when there is no match, meaning that the relationship between the color temperature of the two lights is off, there's nothing really we can do in camera or in post to make it work. So I opened the app, measured the light coming from the table lamp, and it was actually coming in at 2800 Kelvin, changed the color temperature of my light sources to 2800, and now we got a much closer match. And now since the relationship is bright, I can make the whole image bluer, greener, warmer and the whole thing is gonna shift properly because the relationships are 
correct. The lighting setup consisted of a cove light, I basically put up a sheet of muslin and bounced three lights into it and then I added a ceiling bounce for some room tone to fill the shadows lightly. So let's take a look at what each individual light is doing in the scene. The whole cove lighting thing is a little bit of a pain to set up, especially when it comes to finding the right balance between each light bouncing into it, but once you've found it, I believe it looks way more three-dimensional compared to a single source like a softbox. Take a look at this. As you can see with the softbox, we still get beautiful lighting, but it's a little bit more flat compared to the cove in my opinion. And the reason why the cove looks more three-dimensional is that basically it gives you an edge, key and fill light all at the same time and since all the lights are coming from the same direction, it keeps it very, very organic. There are certain scenarios where the color temp of a source might be a mixed one. For instance, what if we want to replicate the light of a late afternoon? What's its color temperature? Well, if you think about it, it's comprised of two light sources. Technically only one source, the sun, but practically the sky also acts like a source even though it's not a source in and of itself. So we have two sources to replicate. One's the sun with its own color temperature and one's the sky, which is a dimmer, bigger, so softer, and most of the times cooler source. In the case of a late afternoon, we have a low sun with a color temp that ranges from 3500 to 4500 Kelvin, and then a slightly cooler sky depending on how late in the afternoon. And that's exactly what I did in this setup. I actually recorded this at night. I set up my sun at a low angle with a Fresnel lens, and since it was a daylight balance fixture, I gelled it with a three-quarter CTO gel, and it was coming in at around 3800 Kelvin. Then I set up my small rig 350B at 4200 Kelvin with a softbox and an additional layer of diffusion to make it as soft as possible to replicate the sky. And especially for how simple the setup is, I think it came out pretty good and I think it's believable in my opinion. And then I tried to replicate a different time of day by changing the color temp of the two lights. I uh, removed the CTO gel from our fake sun and placed it higher to replicate the temperature and the position of the sun at around 11 in the morning. Then I kept the small rig 350B replicating the sky in the same exact position, but I raised the color temperature to 6500 Kelvin to better match the cooler color temp of a clear sky. And once again, I quite like the results. It looks pretty believable to me. You see, by observing the color temperatures of the lights we experience every day, like the sun and the sky, we can very easily recreate different moods based on what we want to show on the screen. By the way, I really love the Small Rig 350B. Small Rig sent it to me to try it out. They didn't tell me what to say or any of that. I used it and I ended up loving it. It's powerful and one of the most accurate lights I've ever used in terms of color accuracy. It's great. 350 watts by color, it packs a punch. It's my key light right now through a softbox with two layers of diffusion and uh, is only at 27%. It's crazy. And just to test its power, I brought it outdoors where it's normally very hard for a light of this wattage to compete with daylight. I placed the subject in the shades at 12 in the middle of the day. I set the light to 6,500 Kelvin and through diffusion, it was still able to give me a level on her face. I was very surprised. And if you compare it to an Aperture 600X, I know the small rig doesn't have DMX and the whole Aperture ecosystem, but if you take a look at the photometrics, this light basically delivers the same brightness of the Aperture 600X at less than half the cost. And it's also more color accurate. So if you need light, I believe this unit is absolutely crazy value for money. Going back to our lighting stuff, the other aspect that characterizes a light source is its fall off. The fall off, or the way the light diminishes in intensity over a distance is dictated by the inverse square law. The law states that the intensity of a light is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the source. So as you double the distance from a light source, its brightness reduces to a quarter of its original intensity. Wait. It's been said a thousand times, you don't need to know any of this, you don't need to know the math. What's important to know is that apart from lights going through projector mounts, which behave differently, the distance from a light source affects its fall off. The closer to the light, the more rapidly the intensity decreases over a distance and the further 
from the source, the less drop in brightness you are going to experience if you move away from the source. Now, why do we need to know this? Imagine that you are augmenting a table lamp, which normally sits fairly close to the subject that it illuminates. Even if it sounds very intuitive, you're going to place your film light right aside a frame as close as possible to the subject to mimic the light fall off of the lamp. Conversely, you might have found yourself in a situation where you are lighting two characters with a single soft light source. And in this particular scenario, you can see that the intensity of the light drops significantly by the time it reaches the subject on the left. And this is because I placed the light fairly close to the subject on the right, and the subject on the left happens to be in the steeper portion of the falloff curve. So if we want to keep roughly the same level across the two subjects, we need to do two things. First, we need to move the light further away, and if we want to keep the quality of shadows the same, so having the same softness, we need to make it bigger so that in relation to the subject it remains the same size as before, roughly. This is where, once again, a powerful light source like the small rig 350B comes really in handy, because it has enough firepower to be able to move it further away, use two layers of diffusion and still get enough output to illuminate our subjects. And now, if we take a look at it before and after, you can clearly see the advantage of having a bigger source further away because this is going to allow you to have a talent or an actor moving more freely without experiencing a drop in exposure. Well, that's all I wanted to discuss today. If you have any lighting related topics that you would like me to cover, just drop them in the comments down below. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe and until next time, bye.